Here we go. The Ilyasoas, decoding your dog's Ilyasoas. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in, or if you're about to join in, well, we're waiting for you, but this is going to be a really, really big subject. I think when it comes to dogs, when it comes to health, when it comes to physical therapy, that is just a word that we hear all the time, Ilya Soas. And I'm really excited today because we have a really, really good friends to the Work So Well family, uh, Dr. Taraka. And she's going to teach us and explain to us what we need to know, what we need to understand, the mechanics, the anatomy, the tips all around decoding your dogs, Ilya's Soas. So I'm very, very excited. If you're seeing this live, great. Welcome. If you are not live, that's okay. This is a recording, but you, you're going to want to save this particular recording because there's so much to learn about the Ilya Soas and kind of demystify all the things that are out there, uh, what's being said about it. So before I get started, I want to introduce a very, very special guest, Dr. Taraka. She is the CEO and operator of Wizard of Paws. If you ever go to Connecticut, if you ever have your dog that needs to be checked, this is the place to go. She's phenomenal. She has a fantastic team. She's got all the latest great tools, and she's constantly innovating and finding new ways to keep our dogs in top shape. So without uh, any further ado, let me find here in our live broadcast. Here we go. Let me hide this and bring Dr. Taraka. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and inviting me and that wonderful introduction and talking about the iliopsoas. Like it's, you know, people often say, oh, I'm so glad it's just the iliopsoas and not a cruise ship. And I think just the opposite. <laughs> so it's a great topic. And thank you for having me talk about it. Well, and I, I kind of view you as the expert on the subject. I know you've done a lot of teachings in different places mm -hmm. about it. So I know that what we're going to talk about here is going to be probably a small fraction of all of the great teaching that you have around it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if you've got some resources, uh, we can add that to the links here in the Facebook or the YouTube so that if there's other courses or things that people can take advantage of. But sure. yeah, th thank you for taking the time because I... I I really appreciate your expertise around the subject. You've worked on my dog in the past, mm -hmm. and I was very, very thankful for that with Sasha. And I just love your way to kind of cut through the BS and really go to what really needs to be done for your dog. So thank you for doing what you do. Oh, uh, thank you. Day. You're welcome. I love it. <laughs> I, I, and I know you do. I think that's what that's what's amazing. It really transpires is that you really do, do love what you do. And, and you have a good team, too. Uh, oh, I have the best team. Absolutely. You, the you have best a great team. location. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's get into this. So yes. I think if I probably to start to really help us, and I know people's knowledge will vary around this, mm -hmm. but so can you tell us about, <laughs> yeah, here's a visitor. Who's that? Yes, this visitor? is little Otter, my little Brussels, who is saying hello. Well, he loves your voice there. So he <laughs> says, hi, good morning, everyone. <laughs> hi there. Hi, sweetie. Um so so, well, I'm glad Otter is going to help us. So talk to us about the anatomy and more importantly, also the importance of the iliosaurus. Because I think a lot of us, um, truth be told, we don't even know exactly where is the iliosaurus yes. muscle. Yes. And it is if um, the iliosaurus is present in people too. And um, it is actually a tight iliopsoas in people, can be a cause of back pain, can um, lead to more issues with knee problems as well. Um, uh, bladder control, because it mm. comprises part of the pelvic floor. I apologize for little otter here. That's okay. And we love dogs. <laughs> he's very curious. Ooh, let me just put him down for a second. Um, and the difference in obviously from people to dogs is that dogs are quadruped. So the action of the iliopsoas is a little bit different in that it acts to extend the hip or bring the hip back. Um, or it's, I should say it's stretched out when the hip is brought back. It's a hip flexor. So it bends the hip, but there's also a huge lumbar or lower back component. And if you look at this picture, you can see that it actually starts from L2 through L7 
dogs have seven lumbar vertebrae while people have five. Mm. And um, it's actually two muscles, the iliacus and then the psoas that come together that join the il- to make the iliopsoas and it inserts into the hip. So all that fancy talk, it means that it could be compromised with something that stresses the back or the hip or both. So for example, if a dog is running and slips its leg out, like the leg comes all the way back, it could aggravate that area both on the insertion, so the hip part and the back part. Mm. And it is a stubborn muscle because often we treat, we look at the lameness in the leg, in one of the back legs, but we forget about the back component. So very important to look at both. And even though it's in maybe medium sized dogs, it's about when it inserts about the thickness of an index finger. Okay. So in cows, it's the filet mignon. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> you want to visualize that in your dog. So it's a very, um, there's not a lot of fat there. It's a very muscular muscle, if you will. So. Excellent. That, so that, that visual there, I think it's, it's good visual. So it really is that last rib, I guess that's where it starts and then goes underneath the spine and then yep. goes down. Got it. it. Comes underneath, and the way we palpate it or feel it is to come underneath, um, near the hip area, and and feel that. So, got it. And obviously, on, there's both sides. Both actually. sides. Right. Yes. Right. right. Okay. Excellent. So we hear about the iliopsoas so many times. It almost seems like it's almost a reflex where oh, it's an iliopsoas yeah. problem. So I think what I'd love for you to do is to kind of help us kind of demystify. How do I really know? And that's really Mm -hmm. the next question for you. How do I really know, is it an Ilya's problem? And and what are those common signs that, you know, obviously we're not experts like you are, but that we can kind of detect um, as as a pet owner, as a pet lover or a pet trainer that they can get a sense of, this might be an Ilya's. uh, Yeah, definitely. And I think we need to look at, is it a primary iliopsoas problem or is it a secondary? So is it compensating for something? And we may see, for example, a dog running on an agility course and all of a sudden they pull up lame. Most likely, I mean, a lot of people will point right away to a cruciate injury. And mm-hmm. here's Otter's little tail. Um, most often it's a soft tissue injury. And okay. so something, it could be the iliopsoas. <laughs> it could be um, something else, you know, a different muscle, especially in some of our racing dogs, things like that. Um, same sort of thing with uh, if the dog is running outside and slips on ice. And the leg may go all the way back into extension and strain the area. Um, One of them, at the end, I'll talk about a Portuguese water dog that was on a trampoline, fell off the trampoline and got its leg caught and had an iliopsoas injury. Um, So, and that was pretty clear cut. And we could see from these images that when the dog, how, when the dog stands where the iliopsoas is located, and when they go to jump, how elongated it is. So in that second image, if that leg slipped back, Mm -hmm. we'll put more tension on it. The same thing if um, the dog is in that position and then starts to slow down, it could stress that area as well. And then we'll also see it as a secondary, so a compensation, maybe for hip dysplasia because the muscle wants to tighten up, maybe for cruciate disease. Um, If a dog has lower back pain or lumbosacral issues, um, it'll also tighten down. Um, There's something called the lumbar transitional vertebrae that we may also see this as a secondary. So it's important to look at, is it a primary issue or a secondary issue? And kind of look at that. There's still, we're going to um, address them in similar patterns, Um, you know, but, you know, can we fix the underlying issue or can we fix the primary issue? Got it. So from a symptom standpoint, then, um, as a 
dog owner, I can mm-hmm. see it. Lemness, I can see is, is probably one of the most common ones based on yeah. what you're saying. Um, is there anything else like uh, what if the back gets rounded? Is, mm-hmm. is there any other signs that I can see as a, as a yeah, dog? absolutely. So lameness. And when this initially happens, that dog may not want to put their leg down at all. It may be um, very difficult for the dog to urinate, defecate, just mm-hmm. because it's painful to put the leg down. Um, after they've been resting and they get up, it's worse. So I see this a lot in our sporting dogs that maybe they were injured mm. you know, during an event, they are put in the crate for the ride home, they get out of the crate and they're non-weight bearing. So, I mean, that could also be a cruciate injury or could be something else. So we wanna make sure we rule everything else out. Um, pain is pain when palpating the muscle. Um, certainly when you bring the leg back into extension and a little bit of internal rotation, it will be painful. Uh Dogs, definitely I always warn the practitioners that I work with and um, that I teach with, be careful because you could approach this area and it is super painful. The dogs could bite and they don't want you, you know, near that area. Right. And then something else we'll see is a decreased stride length. So they're not okay. extending as much. And um, we do dynamic gait analysis is, that's a long word, here. And um, we could see a decrease in weight bearing and a decrease in extension as well, because it hurts to come back. That's, that's really good insights. Um, so Dr. Taraka, when, when you say that it hurts, mm-hmm. is there a specific area within the iliopsoas where it tends to hurt or it could be anywhere throughout? Yeah, really good question. So we'll definitely see the muscle belly. So kind of the middle part. Okay. Um, We may see where it inserts into that lesser trochanter and the back often spasms also. Again, looking at where that muscle is originating from and the lower back is sore or painful. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Now that's, that's really good insights. And there again, you know, Dr. Taraka has given us a a high level of the iliopsoas. I consider her the expert on the Mm -hmm. subject. She does a tremendous job in in diagnosing and treating. And, uh, and again, we'll put more links of if people want more information and and workshops and so forth that you've done around the subject. Um, Well, now that we kind of have an idea of the anatomy part of it, what are the common signs? I think what we should talk about is, um, and you kind of touched upon that a little bit, Mm -hmm. but what are the causes? But so the causes is one thing, but also the risk factors. Sure. What can we do to be proactive as a, you know, as a dog owner to, to be careful not to cause it? Yes. So one of the things that I say, and probably my owners get sick of, uh, hearing this from me, but proper strength, especially core strength. So okay. when we look at where that lower back, so the stronger the dog's core is, the better we're going to be. Um, it is very involved in jumping. And so dogs that are involved in jumping sports, really waiting until the dog is skeletally mature. So maybe 18 months to do a lot of jumping. I I, I don't want to go quickly on this one. Yes. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think what you're saying is so important because in different sports, maybe fly Mm -hmm. ball, dog diving, fast cat, agility, of course, that is one thing that I see so many times. Some, sometimes their friends, they see a dog that's super athletic, Mm -hmm. got the drive and they can't wait to get Mm -hmm. the dog to compete. Um, So, Repeat that one more time, and if we yes. let that sit in, and, and really stress that for the well-being of that dog. So, yes. when should I really start going full blast? So I always say, don't rush it. Wait until growth plate closure, and that could be anywhere from ten to twenty months, depending okay. upon the breed, um, depending upon the dog. But you know, really wait, develop their fundamentals, their core strength, their balance, their proprioception, body awareness, all of that sort of stuff. Um, And this goes too for probably one of the big ways I see this muscle injured is ball playing. So owners will toss a ball and I work with um, a lot of the police dogs and the state police dogs and 
one of the things I tell the graduating classes is do not take that Kong and repetitively throw it without a proper warm up of the dog. Um, as we're coming into fall and the weather's a little bit cooler, we tend to see soft tissue adaptations you know, with our own bodies. So if right. it's cooler in the morning, then it warms up and then in the afternoon it drops down. And we think this is a, a muscle. You know, so taking the dog out when you get home from work at five o'clock and you don't want to walk the dog for exercise, so you decide you're going to play ball. Not a good, you know, not a good idea. Um, we need a warm up there. And that's probably from my non-sports clients. The number one way I see issues with the iliopsoas is repetitive ball playing. Um, so huge there. But these dogs need the proper strength. They need to be a good weight. You know, everyone, we look at dogs and like people, everyone, <laughs> apologies again here. Otter is, uh, wants to put in his two cents. <laughs> Showing up the lean body of Otter. Yes, lean body mass, all of that. Right. Um, but looking at that and making sure, you know, that proper core strength, also proper warm up and cool down, as I was mentioning. Yes. So, you know, before any sporting event, you know, making sure that there's a warm up, um, taking the dog out for 10, 15 minutes, and not only our athletic dogs, but our confirmation dogs. Um, I see a ton of them, and this is a common problem with them as well, because they're in a crate, they're in a kennel, they come out, they show, and they may not have that reach. You know that they they want to so actually that's a subject that um our audience will definitely want to hear more is your wisdom and advice around warming up and cool downs uh, i think we should do a separate live just yes on definitely uh, yeah i think that's something that's very very valuable uh sometimes people are like in sports competitions you when they sit around for a long time mm -hmm. uh, there's only x amount of time you've got the trainer that's getting ready to to walk that course of different things yeah. but i think your wisdom around that i think we should do one of the top top five definitely. things to do uh we should definitely have you come back and, and talk about that definitely so you, you talked about some of the, the causes and you talked about aiming too young, being mm -hmm. too hard and pushed with the ball, not being warmed up uh, mm -hmm. properly. Um, is there any other causes that um, dog owners or should really be thinking about as well? Was that covering yeah. the, the main ones? So I would also say if the dog is chronically injuring their iliopsoas, you know, or it never really goes away. So what is underlying? So get things checked out like their knee like their back, do they have a hip issue? Um, you know, so like anywhere in our body, is that muscle tightening down to compensate elsewhere? So, you know, what, a, you know, what is going on there? Um, where else in their body? Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And as far as risk factors, you talked about, you know, some of the elements here so far and also the leanness and the health of the dog. Are there any other, um, environmental or anything that's specific that, that are risk factors that uh, a dog owner should be thinking about? Yeah, I think too, when we look at the dog's environment, so a lot of, um, I call it fence running, you know, the dogs that are in the backyard and they're great exercise, they wear them out, but definitely could cause an injury. So they're running and turning. Um, same thing with jumping up in a kennel. Um, you know, springing like a pogo stick, you know, up and down. Uh, dogs that are crated a lot and tend to spin in one direction. And, you know, that's an usually an anxiety issue. But then we look at the soft tissue ramifications and, and all of that. Um, also, I look at dogs involved in obedience that have been taught a healing position very early on. And as they're healing, just the imbalance in the body. And so if there's not enough core strength there while they're healing, we're going to have, you know, changes in their body. So to mm -hmm. most um, obedience people don't want to heal on the other side, but, you know, we'll make sure that we stretch. Um, and again, like starting that core strength. And that's something that you can start at two months of age and start building. Really? Up. So, mm-hmm. 
Got it. That's 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 good insight, boy. That's that's another whole different subject. Oh yes, a whole nother thing. <laughs> core exercises. Um, okay, so I think I'd like to switch gear a little bit before we mm -hmm. go into tips for owners. I, I want to understand your process. Mm -hmm. I want to understand what you do, um, your approach in probably diagnosing and tackling mm -hmm. the alien psoas and and. Perhaps the innovative aspect as well, because mm -hmm. I would tell you uh, one of the things I've learned in working in the, with the veterinary world for a very long time now, um, not every veterinarian really has a good grasp mm -hmm. on all those different specialties. And this is definitely a specialty. The ability right. to, to diagnose, treat uh, effectively the iliosaurus, that's an expertise. And that, that's what you do. That's why I call you the expert around yes. the subject. Yes. Um, so can you help us understand what your approach is when you, you have identified that you have an injured iliopsoas, mm -hmm. what do you do? Like yeah. what's, what's your process? Yeah. So definitely, you know, confirming, um, and you know, often we'll have dogs come in that ideally they've had a musculoskeletal ultrasound, um, to okay. determine that's not always available in different parts of the world or the country. So, um, you know, we want to rule out other things. So making sure the x-rays or radiographs, you know, even if the dog does have hip dysplasia, we'll address that as well, but making sure there's nothing else going on. And I always tell owners and veterinarians and um, rehab practitioners that in humans, soft tissue injuries are very prevalent. In animals, of course, an animal is lame. The first thing, we'll clear it with radiographs, make sure there's not a fracture, tumor, all of that sort of stuff in there. But then, you know, we're often, the owners are often told, oh, you know, everything's fine, rest the dog, and then bring them back. So if tissue injuries, probably rest is one of the worst things because mm -hmm. they're resting, they're not working, all of that. So we'll use um, rehab diagnostics, so things like uh, digital thermal imaging um, to look at, you know, any kind of heat uh, with the, the dog, um, or dynamic gait analysis, which will demonstrate how much weight they're putting on each limb, what their stride length is like, a good thorough exam palpation, as I mentioned, that... Um, when you extend and internally rotate, they're often very painful. So we're going to determine from limb to limb how much extension they're, they're missing, um, the lower back pain if present, or decrease what we call passive intervertebral mo mobilizations or movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to treat according to the problem. So if the dog is super painful, we have a lot of tools that we may use. Um, laser or photobiomodulation is one. Um, shockwave therapy, I like to use the piazza wave into the area and treat not only that muscle belly, but also the lumbar area. Got it. Usually after laser, as long as we can get into that, we'll... Um, do this in the clinic and also recommend it at home to pop open the one TDC tablets and massage that into the iliopsoas. And usually after laser where you have that great cell permeability, this is absorbed nicely and the dogs will tolerate it well. And then we have owners do that at home as well. Um, yeah, that, that does. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and You've kind of become the expert in the field, actually, for us to talk about the one TBC, the topical use. Uh, and that's 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 true. That's huge in promoting uh, mm -hmm. healthy inflammatory responses and it being so absorbent. So you you use it and you've you know, you and I have talked about this uh, many times, but you use it after a laser treatment. Correct. Uh, in clinic. And you've actually done some great videos for us for that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and, you're and then you, you have them do it. Uh, topically at home, which I've done with, with my dog uh, many yeah. times. Um, so it, does that mean that the iliopsoas, the painful part, is it, uh, is it primarily because you, you're trying to fight the, the inflammation that's going into the muscle? The inflammation and the body is, so when you look at these dogs too, they don't move freely and they're almost tucking their butt under. Um, mm -hmm. So you get that little roach to their back and they're, you know, there's a lot of 
I always say a lot of internal parts underneath there too. So they're very protective and, um, you know, slowly working them into that extension and, um, you know, getting that pain, that inflammation to be reduced and getting that tissue extensibility. Of right. course, if it's an acute case, we don't want to do a lot of stretching. We want to kind of work into that. And I have to tell you, owners love to apply the one TDC at home, you know, because owners, especially in the acute phases, you know, what can they do at home? You know, we, yeah. there's not a lot. I mean, there's definitely pharmaceutical interventions, but just, you know, getting to do something physical to the dog, you know, not only helps the owners, but helps the dogs. And it's so great for them too. Excellent. Yeah. No, and thank you for, for teaching that. Cause I know you've been very vocal at different um, events, star, stars symposium, mm -hmm. which I just came back from um, in, in helping them out. Um, so it's clear that you have a lot of um, strategy. Let me share. That's a little screenshot of some yeah. of the diagnosis that you do. Uh, when they come into your practice at the Wizard of Paws, you've got, I, I know this is a little small as a picture, but mm -hmm. so you, you do a lot of different elements to right. diagnose and then monitor, I would imagine, the progress. Right, right. And this is just the, so this is the gait analysis. And if you just look quickly at the feet, um, so the paws, um, you can see that the green is this dog did have an iliopsoas issue and um, was not bearing all of its weight onto its left hind limb and it was putting more weight onto the right hind limb so you know something to think about here too is some dogs are so prone to cruciate injuries mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we're getting more weight onto the left reducing that stress on the right so that's something and we can also look at the fact the dog is not putting all its weight on the right hind, uh, right forelimb as well. Right. So, um, you know, there's a lot of body changes here and a lot of, you know, movements that occur, you know, as well. So. That makes sense. Uh, what are you finding? Cause you mentioned the cruciate and I, I could totally mm -hmm. see that when it's slim, the first reaction is a pet owner. You think it's the knee. Sure. Um, are you finding that if they have a cruciate issue that they also tend to have mm -hmm. illustrious issue and vice versa? What's, I mean, I don't yeah. know if you can a percentage, but what, what do you generally find? Yeah, great question because, you know, it may be a cruciate injury that maybe 10% of the ligament is gone, which honestly, there's so many dogs walking around that have this and, will compensate. Um, so we'll often see if a dog has a cruciate injury that their iliopsoas needs attention because mm -hmm. they're protecting it. Um, I use the analogy and some people will understand this. If a person puts on high heels and they're walking and they haven't walked in high heels for a long time, their back hurts and often their mm -hmm. hips hurt because it's just changed the biomechanics of the body. Right. With the, with the dog, if there's a cruciate injury, the iliopsoas will have to work harder to stabilize. And if it doesn't have that power or strength, it'll become sore. So we start to see that. And then not every iliopsoas is a cruciate, um, but it's something that we suspect. You know, So are they compensating? Did they do something because they had an issue? So... My peanut gallery is commenting. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We all are dog lovers here. We yeah. can handle a little bit of barking. <laughs> um, no, that, that's great insight. So you have your own very specific uh, process. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably would help. Um, it would help right now is to kind of go to the next phase and really educate uh, a pet owner in thinking of what tips can we provide them. And I kind of want to break that down in a couple of ways. One is to kind of have that self-determination. I might have an alias mm -hmm. source problem. Yeah. And second, and this is kind of a tough question, but what should I be looking into from mm -hmm. my veterinarian's ability to determine the problem? Sure. Yeah. And I always like some of the things we've talked about, you know, definitely mm -hmm. preventing them. I mean, dogs do crazy things, you know, like we know that there's, we're not going to stop them from chasing a squirrel. And, you know, sometimes they just, you know, they're not so smart. Um, 
But as I mentioned, the repetitive activities like ball playing, frisbee, all of that sort of stuff, especially if the dog is not warmed up, if they're not in good shape. So I always say, like, get an honest assessment of your dog's weight and condition. You know, so most of the, the dogs in the U.S. are overweight. Um, you know, during the pandemic, it definitely kind of hit, you know, uh, a huge, huge whatever number, if you will, but um, looking at the condition, like people often ask, what's my favorite exercise to do for your dog? And I tell them, walk your dog. Like really walk your dog. It's so great for you, for the dog. And, you know, I swear that dogs that live in the city are in much better shape than dogs that live in the country, you know, because they let them out in the backyard and who knows what the dog is doing. So <laughs> More of a controlled um, environment, huh? Yes, exactly. So they're walking, they're you know doing their exercise, all of that. Um, the proper warm up and cool down. Not never take a dog that you've been so active with and just stop, you know, or put them into a crate. It's kind of like if you or I are raking leaves or shoveling snow and we're busy, 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 and then we sit down in a chair and we go to get up for sore, you know, so we think about the dogs and, you know, all of that. Um, I talked about core strength, making sure this is something simple and, you know, easy for owners to, you know, to do. And like, you know, this um, picture here, a dog working, this dog was active in fly ball and had an iliopsoas injury. And we were working on getting that, what's called eccentric or that slowing down strength that's often when the iliopsoas becomes injured. So working on different core exercises, and that could be a balance board, that could be standing on a dog bed, and similar to us doing Pilates and you know other types of bird dog and all of that sort of stuff that we would do. Um, but that's so important to you know maintain their strength. And as I already said, not exercising them too young. And here, that little picture with um, one of my dogs, this is a great stretch and exercise to start with. So front paws up, and this helps stretch mm. out the hip, hips and the lower back, and also an unstable surface will help work on the dog's core and start to engage that. So these are simple things that you can do at home and tell people even if you're heading to the park and you're taking the dog out of the car, you can do something like this by asking the dog to put their feet up on a rail or their car bumper or anything like that and repeat it. And then the same thing on the way, you know, the way home before they, they come into the car. Is there, Dr. Taraka, is there a certain amount of time that you should have the, the dog hold? I'm asking you this because, um, as you know, Sasha, my little senior dog, she's 14 and a half. So she does walk twice a day, at least 30 minutes. So she so does awesome. the walking that you talk about. And she's in the yeah. city. So she's pretty restricted in her environment. But one of the things I do when I actually brush her teeth every night, I always have her prop up to work those back legs. I don't have the decentric, I, I guess, yeah. just there propping up. But I, I always wondered, you know, how long should I keep her that way? Obviously, it depends on the, you know, the, the ability of the dog as well. But do you have like kind of a... And I know we probably need a whole teaching just on yes. that. Let me come back and talk about that. But just as a quick tip, is there a specific time in, I mean, is it twice a day, once a day? What, what would you highlight? Yeah. Right no, here? that's, you know, I usually say do it three times and try to hold for 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, got and it. And you could do that twice a day easily, you know. And I like try to think. I know life gets crazy. Even with my own dogs, I try to do this you know, throughout the day, definitely before we go for a walk and when we come home and before they eat. So they Good. have to do something. So just kind of to remind me as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we could uh, share um, the team here on tips. Uh, and I've, I've shared with you, I asked you as well, if you, and then I know it's a sub tender subject, but if we have, um, you know, you have some lameness, you're taking to the veterinarian. Mm -hmm. um, how do I know if that person knows how to check for the iliosaurus? Yeah, so it's a good, and like, 
in all fairness, especially with what's gone on in the veterinarian world in the past three years, you know, we, if your dog is lame, we want to make sure there's nothing else going on there. So we want to make sure it's not a fracture, not a tumor, you know, that everything is fine. Um, and then, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of veterinarians, especially, they maybe were taught how to palpate the iliopsoas, but then forgot because they have so many other things going on in their mind and, you know, so many other important things to do. So if you're suspecting this and this is more chronic, you could definitely come to someone like me, find a veterinarian that's specialized in sports medicine. So okay. there's an organization, AC. American Veterinarian Sports, A, <laughs> I have to think about this, um, ABSMR, and uh, you can find a practitioner in your area. If there's no one in your area, you can find um, an orthopedist um, that specializes, or, you know, a vet, like I always say, ask around okay. and ask about, you know, who knows sports medicine and who is, you know, used to feeling this. And, you know, it, I, teach so many courses to veterinarians and it's something we go over all of the time you know how to palpate because different dogs different and you know you always learn something from different dogs and all of that sort of stuff is there without trying to do your own diagnosis but at yeah. least to get some form of indication uh, you mentioned earlier on on on, on this uh, call that there's the aspect of the lameness, which is a mm -hmm. given. But is there anything that I can do as a uh, as a non practitioner, and I'll have the knowledge, but just to get a, a sense of it, whether it could be the LUC yeah. as, as a pet owner, is it wh what can I do to palpate without hurting the dog? Basically? Yeah. So definitely, um, even before you palpate, you could look at can you extend or bring back each leg. Okay. You know, so if you can do it on the right leg, but the left leg, the dog says, no, sir, you know, you're not doing that at all. You know, it would be suspicious why, you know, what's going on there. And then we could look at even if an owner can't do that, can the dog put its front legs up on something like my dog was doing? And if they're doing that, are they unweighting one limb versus the other? Or are they reluctant to do that? You know, very often dogs with iliopsoas issues don't want to jump into the car um, because they can't get that motion. You know, they can't do it. Or they start to take a running start up the stairs because they don't have that power to do that. Excellent. Um, if I, as a pet owner, put my hand, now that I know it's the last rib in the back and, and mm -hmm. on the inside, um, is... Is it okay for me to put my hands on it? Should I feel heat? Uh, how much pressure should I put in? Yeah. Will the dog, you know, what should I be looking for signs from the dog as, as I, I guess, palpate myself? Yeah. Is and you could definitely, so if you come closer to the hip, I mean, some dogs may not even let you near that area and you have to be very careful. They don't bite you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can feel in there, you'll feel, um, I call it almost like a ropiness. Okay. Um, and very often heat and that will signify inflammation um, but more often than not your chronic cases will tend to have that ropiness your acute or just happen cases will have more of that heat there got it so when you say the ropiness just to be specific and um, in understanding what that means so i can sense it so it, it feels like a rope actually that's underneath mm -hmm. the skin yeah Got it. And yeah. I would assume then then you have some kind of form of adhesion of that muscle, I guess, exactly. as they go to the spine and so forth. And that over time, I guess, gets inflamed and right, must, right. Be, must be painful. And, and I, you can I, compare it to the other side. Ah, and, good point. You know, see. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And I can totally see, you know, obviously your your wisdom there to use the one TDC topically because you're promoting mm -hmm. healthy inflammatory responses. So it'll probably help uh, any form of work that you're doing. So you're, you're using laser, you're doing the different treatments. Um, I guess that's kind of a, a hard question to ask because I guess it varies on patients, but how long does it take to heal? I mean, if I have, and I know this, I'll let you answer that. So yeah, I'm a pet owner, my dog's land, yep. comes in, got illness, soys issue. What am I looking at? Time yeah, it's, you know, honestly, it could take a month. 
I've had other, like the most common scenario is dog is looking good and owner will go back and do something like, you know, play ball or something and the dog re-injures it. So this is probably where I see the most re-injuries. Um, and it's really tough to not have them overdo it. Um, I had a very, one of my favorite clients, favorite owners, and um, he had a field trial lab that had an iliopsoas issue. And I remember when he came in and he looked at me and very gruff and he said, you're my third rehab place. Wow. And if you can't fix my dog, like, he, and he was very, he said, my dog's not walking over cones. You know, all of this stuff hasn't worked. I don't know what's going on. And he has to go back. He was a Canadian master hunter, an American master hunter. And um, had a long talk with him. I said, okay, like for him to go back to getting the ducks and, you know, chasing and hunting and all of that, it, you have to give me a solid three months and then we'll start working and get back to activities. And it took him six months where at, from the three to six month, we were assimilating working activities in, but he was still coming in twice a week working. He was in the underwater treadmill, maybe 40 minutes each session. In addition to everything else, he was doing core strength, all of that. So, and he did fine, you know, but we had our, our little bit of hiccups. Um, but the most common thing is the dogs go back too soon and, you know, don't, uh, don't give it enough time to rest. So, you know, there is no definitive end where I can say, okay, two months, you're going to be fine. Cause it all depends upon the dog. And some dogs are, are more difficult to stop doing crazy things. Right. You know, little Jack Russell may be jumping around the house and the apartment and, you know, you're trying to restrict that. So. Uh, so it's, it's a journey is what you're saying. Yes. It's, it's not going to be solved over time. And um, so I think what would be really interesting um, for you to come back is to talk mm -hmm. uh, definitely on a few items. I uh, definitely want to hear more about the warm up and the cold. Mm -hmm. I think this is, this is a must. This is always a very, very uh, thought after for any mm -hmm. owners, especially, you know, the, the athletic folks out there. And then the second part, too, is I'd love to have you come back and talk more about the actual types of exercise. And I know this is a whole science. You have a lot of expertise mm -hmm. around that. But just some high level tips, I think, would be important because what I've heard as well is sometimes people can overdo it. Absolutely. To, to actually aggravate and cause some of those issues. So I think that the balance, I think, is the key. Yeah. Um, do you recommend it? I think as as we, we end uh Mm -hmm. just doing here. I, I want to ask you just one thing, because I have some friends in the canine sports, actually one that just won the uh, AWC, Jessica, as you and Perry the yes. they did phenomenal. So we're so happy for them, one TDC dog. Yes, yes. Um, but I, one of the things that uh, I've always admired in, in, their, in their training, and I, I want to get your feedback on this, is people get so into exercising a dog so much as an athlete, and they are athletes, mm -hmm. is – the resting period. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always liked about Jessica, she's always had the approach to really give like, I think it's the winter that she does take yeah. them off for a whole month. Absolutely. And so I wanted your, your thought on that in relation to the iliosoas and getting that rest. Is there any good protocols that we can give people? Yeah. So it's not like, there's not any hard and fast rule, but I completely agree with the rest, you know, period, even, my uh, one of my daughters is an avid horseback rider and That's I always, right. you know, watch with the horses and her trainer because if the horse jumps for the weekend, he gets the week off of jumping, you know, mm. and what a concept, you know, and I often say that to my agility owners and fly ball and all of that, like, you know, not only do we need that rest off from the activity, you know, so during the week, but just a down period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that doesn't mean do nothing with the dog. We can do different cross training and, you know, agility used to be seasonal. You know, now it's not. That's right. So, um, but that time off, like if we look at any professional athlete, any collegiate athlete, high school athlete, they take a period off from their sport and do something else. So again, you know, it could be that 
instead of those high powered movements involved with fly ball, agility, dock diving, that for the time off, the dog is walking or hiking and something at a more moderate level. So, yeah. yeah. That's, and that might prevent, that might prevent some of the iliopsoas injuries that, that, yeah, that is definitely. so prevalent. Um, I know we could probably talk another hour. Of this yes. Because, and I know you have so much knowledge and, and, and treatments and, and protocols that you're doing. You give us a, a high level view. We're very, very thankful for that. I hope it's, uh, it's been very valuable for those that are listening and, and probably gives you a better craving to learn more. And, yes. uh, and we'll put links at some of the teachings and so forth that you have some of the, I know you've done some classes and, and so yeah. forth on that. So we definitely want to make that uh, accessible, but um, we're going to have you back. There's more subjects awesome. we want to cover. Uh, it's, it's very valuable. Either if you're a trainer, you've got athletes, or if you're just a pet owner, I mean, just knowing how to manage the ilias so as in being proactive, especially as they get older. Um, Dr. Taraka, I really want to thank you for your time. Oh, and, thank and you your so wisdom. much. And, thank and your you. love for dogs. I know you. this is not just a job for you. This no, is I love it. I always say every day I come to work, I love it. I learn something new every single day, and I love it. I love what I do. Well, thank you so much, and we'll have you soon uh, back on and learning more. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.